Right, so uh, what did you guys notice was different tonight? Uh, pizza ran out. That's how it happens every time. What did somebody say over there? You had a friend. I had a friend. Very good. So um, I have an announcement about that, but I'm not going to start with that because there was a complaint before that uh, people come and talk about stuff that's relevant to them, like their startup. I don't have a startup, but um, uh, they talk about stuff that's relevant to them, but don't do anything that's useful for you. So I'm going to talk about this topic, why your startup needs tests, and then I'm going to have an announcement. So uh, hold on for that. Um, so I want to talk to the coders in the audience. So who writes code? Raise your hand. Okay, keep your hand up. Which of you wrote a test today? Put your hand down if you wrote a test today. Which of you wrote a test this week? <laughs> All right, who's still got his hand up? Who's ever written a test? If you've never written a test, keep your hand up. Okay, good. Oh, there's, some, there's one hand in the back. All right, good. So I want to encourage you to write tests for good reasons. So I want you guys all to listen. I'm going to poll you at the end and see whether those of you who kind of maybe wrote one this this week or this month, but not writing very many, I'm going to try to encourage you to, to do it, but for the right reason. And uh, the way I'm going to ask you to remember that is uh, with three different words that start with the letter D. And I'm going to tell you some stories from uh, Tim Group, the company that, that I currently work at. There we go. This is just my house where I live in Folkestone. Um, it's an excuse to talk about me. Um, so I joined Tim Group in one of its incarnations in 1999. We started our business um, in financial services in 2004. We had a few folks who were kind of developers, but none of us really knew Java, and we taught ourselves from the beginning. We had no revenue um, in 2004. This past year, we had 10 million pounds in revenue. Um, in that, that time, we had about four developers. Now we have a, a group of about 49. So um, if you want to know why I might know something about how to do this, that, that history should tell you that I have some war stories to tell, which is what I'm going to try to tell you. Um, so the first thing that people think about when they think about tests is they're going to defend me against my terrible bugs. Bugs will not happen. Customers will be happy. The software will do what it's supposed to do. That's almost unimportant to startups. So people often skip tests because they're still a startup. It doesn't matter to me. So the story about that, um, in the early days of Tim Group, um, uh, we had a tiny little office and um, it had hardly any room. And I was uh, sitting in my chair and I, I rolled back too fast. I just kind of pushed back from the, from the desk because I'd finished something. And I knocked over the server because the server was in our office behind my desk. So our server literally fell over and it wasn't working. So I said, oh, screw it. I'm not going to bring it back up. We don't have any users anyway. Who cares? We were so pleased when someone wrote us an email and said, where's the server? We got to use your product. What's going on? They were really, we were really excited. Somebody cared. So um, I, I don't think we ever got as far as adding a bug on purpose, but um, we were really chuffed that we, that was our day we went live because we had a real user. So you shouldn't care about defense too much. The place you might care about defense is if you have a high volume startup and you're about to go on TechCrunch or something like that, put in some performance tests. That's going to be relevant to you. But protecting yourself against terrible bugs, you should just be so happy that somebody wants to use your product. If there's a bug, no problem. That, that's, that's my philosophy on that. Um, so, but that's the, the prejudice that people think, oh, tests are for defense. There's two other reasons to look at tests. So uh, I don't know how readable this is. Does anybody recognize this? What kind of test is this? Yeah, uh, it's not Behat, that's Behat is the PHP version, but uh, this is Cucumber, the same kind of thing. Uh, this is a language called Gherkin, which these kinds of tools use. Tests can actually be totally readable. So this is in English, but it actually is executable. I'm not going to go into details about that, but look up things like Cucumber, Gherkin, behavior-driven development is the fancy term for this. But the, the overall result is that you get documentation for your code. Now, really, in a startup, you shouldn't care that much about documentation. If you got any users, they're going to ask for documentation. You're going to be really happy, just like having a bug, right? So don't worry too much about that, but there's a place where documentation is really important. Um, anybody use the Facebook API a couple years ago? Put a hand up if you used it. Was it a fun experience? Did you enjoy using the Facebook API? Yes, no? No. OK, why not? Because it was really hard. No documentation. No documentation. Didn't work. Things didn't work the way the document, when you could find one, it actually worked. Is it gotten better or is it still the same? It's worse. It's worse. Fantastic. All right. So Facebook can get away for, with that because they've got 400 billion trillion users or whatever it is. So you can't get away with that. So if you have, particularly if you have a, a, a hot startup on your tail, you know, there's several people in the same space, if you have a good, easy to use, well documented API, 
you're going to attract more developers, more people to interact with you, more partners, it's going to be easier for you. And you actually can do this in code that you can execute. And if you want to know about that, you can come ask me about it. I can tell you much more about how to make that work if you don't know. Um, but you can make user-readable documentation that's executable and it's always up to date. So you don't wind up like Facebook. Um, another guy who knows a lot about that is Ade, wherever he is, because he knows a lot about uh, Google's APIs. Um, so documentation can be a really good use for tests. Um, and this is Canterbury Cathedral. It's not far from where I live. It's a beautiful example of fabulous design um, where everything fits together really wonderfully and it's a, a lovely building to go to. Tim Group's applications are not beautiful examples of fabulous design. They're examples of what happens when you take somebody who has written one Java program in his life and you ask him to write another Java program <laughs> in 2004 with very poor tools um, and not much knowledge. So um, uh, I was lucky enough to have heard of some design patterns. Um, anybody know the singleton pattern? Yeah, yeah I hear some laughs. OK, good. Um, so I'd heard of that, and I thought it was a really great idea. Actually, I actually went to one of our board members who was very technical, and I said, what do you think about the singleton thing? I've just heard about it. I think I'm going to use it all over our application for everything. He said, wow, that's a really good idea. Sounds great. Developers at Tim Group are still cursing me for doing this eight years later. Um, do not make this mistake. Now, what's this got to do with tests? Well, if you write tests in a very uh, good way, in other words, if you make your code test a bowl, it is almost impossible to make that kind of dumb design decision. You can still make plenty of dumb design decisions, don't worry. There's plenty of dumb things to, still to do, um, but uh, you won't make that kind of really horrible, eight years down the road, kills you um, kind of mistake like I did. So please don't do that. Um, and there's a book I'm going to show you in a minute um, that explains exactly how to do this. You can read it in a weekend. Um, and uh, uh, this kind of making your code testable is probably the very best benefit of writing tests, but nobody talks about it. So there are three Ds. Um, uh, uh, defense, not that important to you guys. Uh, documentation, kind of important, particularly if you've got an API. And design, easy to make really big mistakes here and make it very hard to maintain your application. So what can you actually practically do? Well, here's two tools that I wish I'd known about in 2004. Actually, I wish they both had existed in 2004. Um, a little hard to see up there, but this is Jenkins. Everybody know what Jenkins is? If you don't know, please go Google it. Jenkins is a very easy to install continuous integration server. Um, you can get it set up on an Ubuntu Linux box in about 10 minutes, and it will run all your tests, and it will tell you when your tests are broken. Very, very nice, low maintenance, um, uh, excellent thing to have. Um, and this is a fabulous book. Um, which explains exactly how to get those design benefits from your tests. And again, you can, this is Java-based, but it's quite relevant, and there's actually some translations on the web into other languages like Ruby. Um, and uh, the examples are fantastic. The people who wrote it are very bright, and they will help you to understand how to write tests first, create testable code, and make sure that it has good design. All right? So if I convinced anybody to write some tests, raise your hand if I convinced you to write some tests. OK, at least a couple people. Good, I reached you. If you're, if you're still doubtful, please come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you more about, uh, about why tests might be re relevant to you. All right, announcement part. So I used to work at Tim Group. I, as of Monday, I don't work at Tim Group anymore. After 13 years, that's a bit of a, uh, a big change for me. It's a big change for a couple reasons. I'm moving from Tim Group to something called Secret Sales, you've probably never heard of. Um, it's about uh, 50 people over in Notting Hill. So I'm moving from finance to fashion. Not, not so sure about that. Might have to have a makeover. Um, and I'm moving from Java to PHP. I'm going to have tattooed on my forehead, PHP is a real language, because it is, if you use it right. And they have some very sophisticated stuff at, at Secret Sales using PHP. I'd love to tell you about it, things like uh, continuous releasing, which we've never been able to do at, uh, at Tim Group. So there's some quite nice stuff. First class functions, it's a real language, really. Um, so I'm going to learn all about what happens at Secret Sales, and that makes some changes that might affect you guys. So this is the Telegraph, and I don't know how well my, uh, my words are coming out there, but it says, I buy you lunch. So that was always my offer, right? As I come here and I'd say, do you like the beer? He said, yes. And I said, would you like some advice and a free lunch? The same deal that, that Jeffrey uh, just made with you. And uh, Tim Group, being in finance, um, quite profitable, doing well, was willing to fund me buying you lunch. So that was a good deal here at the Telegraph. Um, some, many of you have come and done that and said the advice was useful. Um, so I said, OK, well, I'm going to be over in Notting Hill with a company that's not doing, you know, it's doing well, but it's, uh, it's not as, uh, uh, as profitable yet. So uh, this says, I'm sorry, it's hard to read, uh, you buy me beer. So I had this idea that maybe you could come to Notting Hill, and instead, because I bought you lunch for a while, maybe you could buy me some beer. 
and, and, and I would still give you startup advice if you'd like that. And then I realized, actually, I don't drink beer. So I have this other idea, which is, you buy you beer. So how this is going to work is um, that I'll have kind of an office hour. I don't know quite how I'll do this. I'll see who responds and how we set it up. But I'll have an hour or two in the evening, and you come around, and I'll sit in the pub, and maybe I'll, I'll nurse a, a, a J2O or something. And you buy yourself some beer. That'll keep the publican happy. And uh, over in Notting Hill, I'll chat to you about your startup and give you whatever advice you'd like. The advice is worth what you pay for it, but some people have said it was useful to them. So you can ask those guys. Who's, who's had advice from me? A few people around here. So go ask them, see whether it was useful to them to get an unvarnished view. Right? So um, I may not be standing up here, it'll be Jeffrey, but he can still give you really good advice and you definitely should talk to him. Um, I always say that we're hiring at Tim Group, they still are. Please go work for them, they're fantastic. You can also, if you want to learn all about the fabulous things in PHP, please come work for Secret Sales. Uh, that's my pitch, that's where to find me, and uh, I'd love to talk to anybody afterwards. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Is that okay? All right. Any questions? Don't have to, but happy to answer them. Please. Uh, I was in a startup and I wrote a really big set of texts and they got really fragile and I spent ages maintaining them and that was wrong. Yes, don't do that. Listen to this man. <laughs> Less of a question than a statement. Yes, so don't do that. There are lots of things you can do so your tests don't become fragile and dangerous. Say it again. Yeah, he's, he's referring to the common name of that book, if I can, oh, I can't go back. Um, the growing object-oriented software is called Goose, because the first four letters are Goose. It doesn't have a picture of a goose, I don't know why. Anyway, yes, read the book, don't do what he did. Next question. Sorry? Why am I moving? Um, I've been at the same place for 13 years, it's a really long time. And um, I, I started to look around and I said, we have these incredibly brilliant guys. Jeffrey's been in the business for 20 years, started his own startups, um, uh, and there's, there's four or five people like that at Tim Group, and they can run the thing. Um, it, it works. And uh, so I said, hey, maybe I'll try something different. So um, try something very different. I may hate it. We'll find out. What makes you think that uh, you could have tested your way out of bad design decisions? Oh, no, I wouldn't have made the bad design, de design decisions in the first place. But wouldn't you just have made tests that Mask the bad design because you would think your design was playing your test. For certain types of bad design decisions, that can totally happen. I said you still can make plenty of bad design decisions. You'll, you'll have plenty of opportunities. For certain design decisions, like singletons, if you build your code so that it, has, it uses uh, dependency injection, mock objects, and so on, if you build your tests that way, it'll be impossible to build singletons. As a matter of fact, your fingers will hurt. You really can, if you, you can if you have to. But the only reason you'd have to is because you'd already made the bad design decision, so please just don't do that, right? Please make the good design decision first. Steve. Uh, the level of testing that you advocate, how important do you think that is for the startup that's trying to do a million things at once? Level of testing that I advocate, um, how important is that for a startup that's trying to do a million things at once? Um, I think it's very important um, because if you design your code well, um, you can bring people on more quickly. You can respond more quickly to um, uh, outside influences and uh, competitors who, who build new features. You can build a feature and ship it quickly. And you're not like, like this chap down here. You have a fragile set of tests, bad design, and you're kind of stuck. And you look around, and this, uh, the non-tech guys in the audience, this, this is something that might be meaningful to you. Kind of look at your developer and you say, can you just add one of these over here? So, boy, that's tough. I don't know, you know, a button, oh boy. That's when you know something went wrong. Like, you need a time machine so you can go back three months and tell them write some tests and read the book. Um, that's, that's when something went wrong. So I'm not advocating write tests for everything. I'm not advocating, um, uh, you know, um, create a huge uh, suite or anything like that. Get the good design benefits and um, some of the defense and documentation. The pains of testing usually comes from not following design principles. You have to follow, like, for instance, the solid principle that basically covers what you have to do to be able to test right things. And after you have this basic knowledge of, uh, uh, of uh, how to code, then the, the test driving will actually improve your code. But you can't start test driving and think you would write beautiful code. You need the principle as backup. Absolutely, so he's suggesting that um, you need good principles in order to get these benefits, no question. So solid principles are a good example of that. I found that when I started testing, I found that certain things were hard and they forced me to learn those principles. So uh, it's a chicken and egg situation. I found that I needed both. 
and I actually relied more on the testing. That just happens to be how I work. There are some people who can write brilliant, wonderful, totally well-designed code without any tests. Good for them. There are like two of them in the world there. It's very hard, but um, if you're a normal, ordinary mortal like me, tests will help force you in the right direction, but absolutely, you've got to have the right, um, the right design knowledge as well. Other questions? Yep. Retrofitting tests. Retrofitting tests. Retrofitting tests. Can we get a time machine? I hate retrofitting tests. They're very painful. So if you made bad design decisions and you want to, um, you want to write tests for that is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, um, and we're stuck with it at Tim Group too. And um, I always tell all the developers, if you find any code I wrote, you can find it in, in SVN and, and, and you see it, just delete it, because if I wrote it, it's almost certainly bad. Um, so that's one method, just delete the old code, but that's probably not an option. Um, it's really painful. And um, you can do it, and you write wrappers around things. For example, if you want to write good integration tests, but your code um, doesn't have good APIs, you can write your own API. You can write a little REST layer so you can actually send HTTP messages to it and get um, uh, HTTP back rather than whatever weird protocol you're using. You can do that kind of a wrapper and that kind of stuff. It, it's really tough. Um, there are some good books on um, uh, working with legacy code is a very good book. Um, I don't know whether it covers testing specifically, but it's that kind of thing that you're looking for. I'd uh, be happy to talk about your particular situation. Come find me. You have to rewrite. Say again? You have to rewrite. Do you have to rewrite? I really hope not. No, um, you don't have to rewrite. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Listen to that man. This is a smart man over here. Listen to him. <laughs> um, uh, Secret Sales is trying to rewrite some of their code. I may have to stop them because um, you don't actually then respond to business needs, and that can be death at a startup. There's a good talk where there was a very much different software about uh, brownfield projects. Really Great. There's a good talk by Steve and Nat on um, brownfield projects. Good. This, this man knows what he's talking about. <laughs> at the back. So, squirrels. Hi, Sanford. Um, do I have any other? Yes, I do, in fact. Um, so I, at, at uh, Tim Group, they um, gave me a shirt. How many people know the 70s um, uh, um, uh, cartoon program that has a mole and another rodent? Does anybody know what this is? No. No? No, no, no it's, a, it's a cartoon, Hanna-Barbera cartoon. I'm trying not to tell you exactly what it is. It's called Secret Squirrel. Has anybody seen Secret Squirrel? So they noticed I was at Secret Sales, and I'm named Squirrel, so they gave me a shirt that says Secret Squirrel. So that's my other nickname is Secret Squirrel. Can you use testing cross-platform? Um, yes, particularly, and I don't have a lot of experience with it, um, but particularly if you um, have APIs to your code, that can be very nice. So you can have um, test your API for, for the back end, and that's common to everything, and then you might have a front end that's in different platforms, but it really matters what, uh, it depends heavily on what you're doing. Mobile um, uh, devices don't seem to have anything like the testing ability. They're kind of like web browsers were in 2002, so maybe in 10 years, um, mobile devices will be as easy to test as browsers are, which is not very hard, to, or not very good, easy today, um, but better. Um, so mobile is particularly tough. Uh, but an API can often help. If you can do everything in your application via an HTTP message, it's pretty easy to test because you just send a lot of HTTP. Um, if you've got to send proprietary protocols, um, do a lot of things over the wire, have very fancy front ends to get to anything, you're going to be in the situation this gentleman's describing where you have a lot of fragile tests. Cool. Thanks. Am, I, am I done? Okay. Come see me if you have more questions. <laughs>